So let's get into it. Um, so, so what I was going to do just quickly to begin with um, is just a quick recap of last week. If you've got your Bibles open, have them with you. Uh, we looked at chapters one and two last week. Uh, and uh, what we saw last week is that we were uh, trying to get into Paul's thought world. Uh, we're trying to get into Paul's thought world to see where he's coming from. And we saw how the, the part of his message is driven uh, by his, his desire for perfect union with his creation. He wants a, a relational covenant justice with us. Uh, and that's the essence of God's righteousness. There's a rightness in how he wants to be a unified and loving, self-giving union with his, with his, with his creation. And, and we saw that how that uh, has been fractured uh, by the wayward uh, sins of, of, of the ways of, the, uh, of humanity and how the gospel that is in Jesus has revealed the way in which that rightness can be restored, how that righteousness can come about, as well as revealing God's heart towards that fracture, and that is the place of God's wrath. And so that's we started looking at that. The, the other thing we, uh, we started to look at was how that God is a covenant-making God. He wants to restore uh, that union. He, so he's about the, the task of reunion. And so we look at a number of the different covenants that God makes throughout the Old Testament. Um, and so we, we began with this sense of, 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 of the, 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 the covenant of love that's at the heart of creation. We saw about how uh, he was at work. Uh, with uh, Abraham and committed himself to a particular family, uh, how he then was committed to them as a nation uh, in the time of Moses and how he also bound himself with a promise to the line of David and, and to promise of Messiah. And each of the promises he made uh, builds back and back and back until it, it's, it's a blessing back to the restoration of the whole world. Uh, Abraham is blessed so the whole world may be blessed. And we saw how all of this, uh, we foreshadowed that, is fulfilled in Jesus. So this is just a quick recap. And finally, uh, we saw, saw how, as we began to look ahead, how Paul began to look ahead to a day of judgment, uh, we began to see uh, and, and to think about what it would mean to be on either the side of God's righteous reunion or contributing to the fracture of, 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 sinful, of the power of sin in this world. And we saw how Paul uh, thought about two categories of people, uh, those who are under the covenant, under the law of Moses in particular, and those who are a law unto themselves, and, uh, and uh, those who are the Gentiles. And so that's what we got to, and, and now we're going to get into Romans chapter 3, and, uh, and we're going to do it into two parts. And so I'm going to go into the first part of Romans 3, then we'll break, then we'll come back for a bit more, and then we'll break again. So um, ha have your Bibles open, we're going to go, and the best way to do it um, at this point is to sort of take a step back, take a bird's eye view, and let's have a little bit of, of an overview of the chapter, and then we'll burrow in, uh, particularly into, the, into verses 21 and, and following. And so firstly, uh, launching right in, uh, we have Romans chapter 3, uh, verses 1 to 8, and we briefly looked at this last week. But here, what we have is we have Paul uh, speaking about uh, uh, the, speaking about the covenant people of God, speaking about the Jews, and he he he, he has been all about how the Jews under the law are just as guilty of being part of the fracture of creation as those who are apart from the law. But he doesn't want to let go of the goodness of the covenant. He's been he's got these. Uh, framework in which God's promises are going to bring new life. And so he doesn't want to lose that. So you see here right at the beginning of chapter three, uh, he's hearkening back to the covenant of Moses. And he says, what advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? There is much in every way. Uh, because first of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. And so we can't lose sight of that, uh, that, that the, the, the law and the covenants are not bad in Paul's sight. They are good, but how, how they are uh, held onto uh, by, uh, by those who are around them, it doesn't, it doesn't lead to righteousness. And then secondly, uh, so that's just the first part of Romans 3. The second part of Romans 3 to look at is uh, verses 9 to 20. And here we see Paul bringing this sense to the crescendo. 
Um, if you look at verse 9, you see this. What shall we conclude then? Are we, the Jews, any better? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. Uh, we are all part of the fracture of the world. And at the very e at the end of that section, at verse 20, he says this. No one will be declared righteous in his sight by simply observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become simply aware. We become conscious of of our sin. In other words, you may be one of the Jews who has the law, but if you appeal to it and say, look, I'm righteous because I have the law, all the law will do is, is look back at you and say, uh, yes, I'm good, and yes, you've broken me. And, and between those two things, between uh, verse 9 and verse 20, uh, he quotes a whole bunch of Old Testament scriptures. You can see that from verse 10 uh, through to verse 18. And he's quoting a number of things, uh, including uh, here you can see Psalm 14 in Romans 3. There is no one who does good, not even one. In Psalm 10, it's quoted in verse 14. Psalm 36 quoted in verse 18. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And you can see he's, he's building up this expression of the predicament of humanity. Um, but there's one thing here that, that I didn't pick up until I read Tom Wright's book. And, and Tom Wright says this about this section. He says, in more or less, each passage, each of these passages here that he's quoting from the Old Testament, in more or less each passage, the charge against the wicked is framed within or followed by the promise that God will act to rescue those who are helpless before evil and to make good his covenant despite everything. So even as Paul is bringing stuff from the Old Testament that looks like it's, it's negative and, 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 and amplifying this sense of predicament, if you knew your scriptures, <laughs> you would find within those quotations the sense in which God is saying this, but he's about to bring rescue. He's about to intervene. And that brings us at, the, at that high point of crescendo uh, that brings us to the, to the main part we're going to look at tonight, which is in Romans 3, uh, 21 to 31. And, uh, we, and, and we get to this one of the most densely packed theological parts of the Bible. And we're going to do our best to dig into that a bit tonight. And, and all of it turns. So Paul has, he has brought his sense of predicament to its high point, And now all turns on, uh, on, on what, uh, what Bible scholars like to, to, like to call the big but of the gospel. Uh, we like big buts as theologians. And uh, the buts that we like are the ones that say, but now God. Uh, this may have been uh, here's the predicament. Here's where we are. But now God is going to do something. And, and we mentioned this on Sunday. If you've seen the Sunday talk, uh, we talked about this. But God is going to do something. He's going to bring uh, the essence of redemption. And what is the big reveal? If we're all stuck in our unrighteousness, then the big reveal is that God is revealing his righteousness. A righteousness from God is being made known. And remember, righteousness is not just about moral purity and things like that. It's about the rightness of relationships, about covenant renewal. It's about being together, reunited with him. And that righteousness comes in alignment with the covenants and the promises that we've been talking about. If you can see here, it says this, uh, verse 21, a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known which the law and the prophets testify about. So this isn't some strange new thing. Uh, the, the whole way of God with his people, all those covenants and promises he's made have been leading to this point, and now it's been uh, uh, re revealed. Uh, but it's not just uh, uh, known by the law. It's also apart from the law. It's bigger than the covenants because it's not just for the Jews. It's for all of God's people. It's hearkening back to that biggest promise of all. It's about the restoration of all people. And where does that righteousness come from? It doesn't come from our law keeping. 
uh, whether we're Jews who are keeping the Mosaic law or whether we're Gentiles that are keeping the law of our conscience. Uh, no, it, and, and it, clearly it's not that because it says here, um, all have sinned, verse 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, both Jew and Gentile. Uh, where does the righteousness come from? It comes from uh, Jesus. That righteousness comes through the faithfulness of Jesus, not through our faithfulness, uh, but through him. Uh, it is the faithfulness of Jesus who will bring about this renewal of God's covenant and of his reunion. It's through what he has done. And it's not for those, this righteousness, this reunion, isn't for those who have kept the law or done good things. It's for all who believe, who are justified freely by his grace. Has right. so everybody kept up with me so far? I'm just, I'm, all I'm doing is going into, into Romans 3 and verses 21. Now, before we break, uh, can I just want to put in front of you um, this, this word justification or those who are justified are freely by his grace. Uh, because the word justification is one of those uh, Christian buzzwords, and uh, and it can we can we can run it around and and uh, put it in our hymns. But what does it actually mean? Um, in, in some ways, the word is uh, is comes from the law courts. Um, if someone is justified, um, it's more than just being declared not guilty. So it's not it's not quite. It's it's stronger than acquitted. It's closer to a vindicated, uh, declared to be right, declared to be right. And it comes with it with a sense of freedom. Uh, nothing is left hanging if you're justified. Nothing is over you. Uh, there's nothing looming. Uh, it, it, it is resolved is the sense of what justification means. And, and it has that sense of freedom. And which is why there's another word in there, uh, which you have a look at um, uh, da, 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 in verse 24, justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came, comes from, that came by Jesus Christ. Again, it's another Christian buzzword, redemption, but it also has that sense of freedom. Uh, and it harkens back to the sense of if you're a slave or an indentured slave, uh, you're held in captivity by your indebtedness. And if someone pays for your debts, then nothing is hanging over you anymore. You are set free. You are declared right. You no longer owe anything. You are righteous. And that's the declaration. That is, that, that is what's been revealed for us who believe because of the faithfulness of Jesus, we have been declared righteous. And that's, again, that's more than just some moral purity. There's also, that's a sense of being declared to be in that reunion with God, there's a relational sense to it. There's a sense of uh, you have been declared right. You have been declared free. You have been declared that you belong. And, and that's where Paul takes us. And then he begins to unpack the how behind this. If that's what Jesus has done, how does it work? And, and as we get into verse 25, which I'm not going to dig into just yet, but I'm going to put it in front of you. As we get into verse 25, we see how does Jesus bring this great gift to us? In verse 25, it's all about the cross. If you read it here, it says, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice. So before we go any further, what I want to do is to break out into our rooms now and I've given you, I've sent around some questions by email, and I'm hoping that at least one person in your room has the question. But what I want us to do is to think about that for a bit and ask simply one question. Um, as in your understanding of the gospel, why did Jesus have to die? Why does Jesus' death matter uh, for this bringing of righteousness, for this justification? So come to grips with that. You can read a bit further into Romans 3 in your group. And so put that in your own words. And then secondly, ask the question, um, and how do you feel about that? <laughs> what does that do in you to, to think about Jesus dying as an aspect of the gospel?
the question I then I, I gave you then was about uh, uh, what, how Jesus brought that righteousness by uh, means of his uh, death on the cross, and and Paul starts to use words such as a sacrifice of atonement and through faith uh, in his blood. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to unpack that a little, and this is the first um, uh, of what uh, I've, I've sort of foreshadowed as being one of the scandals. Uh, that lies within the gospel of Jesus that that can confront us and which we need to willingly let us confront, confront us. And the question that, that is underneath it is, why did Jesus have to die? And there are a couple of ways in which we can unpack that uh, as we look at Romans 3, uh, 25 to 26. And um, there are two intertwined aspects to why uh, why the crucifixion and the cross of Jesus matters. And so we're going to engage with those two things. They both intertwine. And the first of those things that intertwine uh, is the concept of justice. And the second of those is the concept of the cost of covenant love. So justice and the cost of covenant love uh, come together uh, in this moment. And, and that's what I want to quickly unpack with you uh, uh, now. So Paul, um, he's he's putting this in front of us. He's not ashamed of it. And he says that God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. And he did this to demonstrate his righteousness. So whatever the cross is about, it's a demonstration of God's righteousness, a demonstration of that loving desire to be reunited with his, uh, with his creation. Uh, so one of the caricatures when people uh, talk about the cross, when people are, are against it and, and, and deride the Christian faith, is that they talk about an apparent arbitrariness uh, as if, you know, if God is judge and if God is all powerful, why didn't he just let Jesus off? Why couldn't he have done it without the cross? Is he a masochist towards his own son? And, and you hear this sort of derision. Uh, but the thing is, uh, justice, which is one of those intertwining strands, is not arbitrary. Uh, Paul has spent the last few chapters uh, talking about how generations after generation after generation of not only the Gentiles, but the Jews have contributed to the fracture of God's creation. There's been sin. And a consequence of that sin is that there are those in creation who have been crying out for justice. Would a just God ignore them? Would a just God hear the cries of the victims of cruelty or even the groans of creation itself and say, well, hey, I'm a nice guy. Uh, I can do whatever I want. Here's forgiveness all around. Everybody go and have fun. Uh, the victims, if you like, the ones who are crying out uh, would be saying, where's the justice in that? And if this was a courtroom, one of those martyred victims could stand before God and accuse him against himself, if that makes sense. Uh, and so God, isn't, so God is, is demonstrating his righteousness by not letting go of this justice. He is full of mercy and his desires reunion um, and in verse 25, we see that in his forbearance, he left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. But now in this, in this giving of Jesus, there is a demonstration of his righteousness that at the present time, he can offer both justification, freedom, life, um, and also be held up as just. And, be, and have justice. Um, and one of the ways in which to grasp this, and there was a question that came in during the week, which I can go into more detail uh, at the end of our time, um, is that uh, one of the things that you see in N.T. Wright, uh, Tom Wright in his book, it sort of goes, gets into this quite a bit, is that the judgment of God will st still happen. That day when justice comes is not got rid of in all of the gospel. In fact, Paul says in chapter 2, verse 6, God will give to each person according to what he has done. And he will deal with the wrong. Um, there are consequences of sin which God cannot avoid unless he be against himself. And so the justification 
is not an elimination of that judgment. It's God entering into it himself. And so on the cross, what is happening is that Jesus is holding all those who believe, all those to whom his righteousness is coming, all those who are being justified. And he's saying, it's as if he's saying to the Father, let's do it now. Render the verdict now. Bring your justice now. Let's fathom the depth of this sin. Let me carry it to the end. Let justice be done. And that's why the death of Jesus on the cross isn't just about the breaking of bones and the shedding of blood. It's about his self-giving, a handing of himself over to creation itself, death at the hands of people, the author of life sinking into the full impact of that fracture that his children have brought about and which have invaded the depths of his human life. Jesus is sinking into that fracture and is, and is, and is fathoming the depths of it. And as an aside, it's also why the resurrection isn't just Jesus coming back to life, uh, breathing again. It's him passing through that into a newness of life because it is truly uh, being dealt with. And at the end of that time, by the time Jesus says, it is finished and into your hands I commit my spirit, there is no one who can say that in exercising grace and mercy and justification that the Son of God has acted unjustly and cheaply. He has demonstrated his righteousness by being able to hold both of these things together. And the point where that intertwines, that justice then intertwines with God's love and is manifest in the understanding that covenant making is costly. Now, we looked at this last week, and, 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 and when we looked at last week, it was almost entirely positive. Right? Here are the promises of God. He's going to bring reunion, and Jesus is the answer to it all. God has bound himself to creation, and, it, and it's wonderful. But it, it's not cost-free. All covenant, all acts of love come with a cost to them. So God bound himself to creation. Uh, God, uh, God uh, poured himself out in this self-giving act of bringing things to being. And there's a cost to it. Um, it the cost of Jesus on the cross was already counted uh, right at the beginning, uh, even as he, he brought things uh, to birth. And all the covenants point not only to the promise, but to the cost of that love as well. And so with, when we look at the covenant with Abraham, you can see that when God makes that promise to Abraham, it's like a treaty, but there's no obligations or virtually no obligation put on Abraham. It's not Abraham, do this or else. It's Abraham, I promise you this. I bind myself to you. And God almost puts the obligations on himself. And that's manifest at the time when Abraham is called by God to sacrifice his son Isaac, if you know that story. And, and Abraham obeys him, he exercises his faith. But before uh, Isaac can be killed, um, uh, 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 God intervenes. Uh, but Isaac actually asked a very prophetic question on the way up to the altar. He says, where is the lamb? And, uh, and Abraham answers in faith, the Lord will provide the lamb. He understood the cost of that promise. And when it comes to the covenant between Yahweh and his uh, people, his nation of Israel in the time of Moses. Well, this is exactly where the, the, the word sacrifice of atonement comes from. You have a whole system of the temple uh, where, where uh, blood and, and, and uh, being in the presence of God all come together uh, in a sense of showing the cost of what it means for an unholy people to live in the presence of a holy God. And so the sacrifice of atonement, which is applied to Jesus, um, uh, is, is there in Leviticus 16, and it applies to that covenant. And then, of course, in the days of Messiah and the, in the promises to, to David, uh, the culmination of the, an understanding of what it means to have a king after the God's own heart uh, it finds its end point uh, in the prophecies of Isaiah when he talks about uh, the messianic king being a suffering servant. A true king comes to take responsibility for his people 
and and so uh, suffers for his people, bears their sins. And you can see Isaiah 53 there is, is the outworking of it. And all of this, as God binds himself to his people to bring about promises, he's taking on the cost of those covenants. And you can see those all the way. Again, just like the promises, the costs go all the way back to showing what it would mean for justice and justification, justice and mercy to be held together. Um, that's, the, uh, that, that's the story that is told. Now, the key thing here, one of the, often when we talk about um, how when we say Jesus had to die on the cross, we go, oh, he had to die on the cross because it was just like the sacrifices of Moses. It was just like the uh, the spilling of blood in the temple, as if the, co- the cross happens uh, because the sacrifices happened in Moses' day. It's actually the other way around. The sacrifices happened in Moses' day because they are pointing to the cost of the covenant that's going to be manifest in Jesus. The sacrifices point to Jesus, not the other way around. It's not just God arbitrarily saying, oh, we better do something because it looks like some ancient religious rite that I got my people to do a few hundred years earlier. No, there's a testimony throughout that's pointing to this intermingling of God's justice and mercy all the time. There's a cost to it, um, and, and it's and it's been paid. Justification is here, and justice has been done. And we can unpack that in the questions uh, later on, if you like. But I want to move on to the second scandal uh, that I've noticed when it comes when this, it comes around this sense of the gospel here, as Paul talks about it in Romans three, and uh, and, uh, and and this is where we'll, we'll finish up. We'll do this one, and then we'll break out into our rooms again. And this and this particular scandal revolves around Romans three, uh, verse twenty two. So if you want to sort of have that in front of you, and within Romans three twenty two, there's this wonderful phrase that in English is four words long, uh, or five words long, through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, in the original Greek, and I don't go here quickly, um, this is dia pistos. Yesu Christu, um, through faith, Jesus Christ. And there's this debate about whether that should be translated as through faith in Jesus Christ or through the, faithful, through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Right? And, and part of me goes, why is this a scandal? Why does this matter? And, and the reason why I'm mentioning is, first of all, because... Um, when you see I've put it up on the screen, I've translated it as through the faithfulness of Christ, right? Uh, the righteousness of God has been revealed, not through our righteousness, but through Christ's righteousness, through his faithfulness, um, which is different to the NIV and quite a few of the other English translations, particularly ones that come from a strong Protestant, strong Reformation background. But if you've been reading Tom Wright's book, <laughs> you'll notice that he actually, I translate it like he does. Um, in terms of Greek linguistics, I think it's actually a better fit. Um, and it actually makes sense within the context of how Paul is presenting his gospel. But And, and it shouldn't be scandalous. People, theologians have been have been talking about this phrase uh, for decades, and, and it's not much more than an interesting academic footnote over a cup of tea in some um, sort of college dining room or something. Um, but in recent years, uh, there's been a number of people who have jumped on this and some sort of reasonably famous Christians have sort of gone, aha, aha, uh, look, I've discovered something in Paul. Look at how all these translations get it wrong. And there's a sense of derision. It's almost like you stupid Bible believing Christians. If you can't get this right, then you've got everything else wrong. You're not saved by faith. You're saved by the faithfulness of Jesus. There's no judgment. You don't need to believe in Jesus. You just need to follow Jesus' faithfulness. And that means your life should look exactly the way I happen to think that it should look like. Right? And it becomes it's become a little bit of a political phrase. The thing is, there's a there is a little bit of validity behind that critique. Uh, because we're we we aren't just justified, we're not what's the head to go? sometimes we, we talk about we're justified by faith. We're made right by faith in Jesus as, as if we've turned faith itself into a work. If I can muster up enough faith, then God will love me. And, and that's a corruption of the gospel. Um, someone has said, 
Our faith is not in justification by faith. Our faith is in Jesus. Uh, we don't have faith in faith. We have faith in Jesus. And, and there's a, a, a right critique when we start putting faith in faith or faith in the way good Christians should look like. Um, and, and so there, there is some validity to it. But it's also a deflection because at some point, of what we need to understand is, is that um, the, the gospel does come to us. The righteousness of God does come to us um, through simply believing. Uh, even though it may or may not be translated faith in Christ or faithfulness of Christ, it's very clear in verse 21, this righteousness God comes from God to all, to the, all who believe. And it is simply about believing. And at some point that will scandalize us because we will always be tempted by self-justification. We will either deny our wrongdoing or we'll elevate our right doing or we'll try and control God's response to us. So it's not about whether we believe in him or not. It's about whether we find him believable or not on our terms. And we'll either attempt to meet God's law or we'll construct a law unto ourselves in which we are virtuous and in which we can stand before God and, and try and stake a claim without believing in him and without having to give ourselves to him. And we will often do this by declaring ourselves saved by how much Jesus looks like us rather than by how much he's calling us to be like him. So here's the scandal of it, you see. Justification is to those who believe. It is through faith in Christ because Christ is faithful. It's a both and. And, and the thing where it gets down to us is this. The world at the moment is incredibly legalistic. Uh, if we talk about the law that we've been talking about, not many of us are tempted by God's law at the moment. That's not the way of the Western world. But we're very good at creating our own legalistic, pharisaical entities. And that's on both the left and right of politics and all the sorts of issues from, the, from, the, from you know, those who would storm a Capitol building in the name of their righteousness to those who would cancel people in the name of their righteousness and, every, and, and quite a few things in between. And, and the salvation that's in Jesus confronts all that. It says, lay down your law. Your righteousness comes not from yourself, but through believing in this one who is faithful on his terms. So that's what I want us to be confronted by. And I'm deliberately allowing it to confront us. I'm not trying to be political or to make a power play. What it leads to is that at the very end of verse 27, it means we cannot boast. Where then is boasting is excluded because of what law? The law that requires works to be a good lefty person or a good right person or whatever you whatever our fancy is, no, because of the law that requires faith. Uh, we are we are we cannot boast because it's Jesus who saved us by His faithfulness. So I'm going to end the presentation there, um, and uh, and I'm going to ask you to get us back into groups, and I'm going to ask us a question, uh, which I've sent out to you, and I, and I don't have the exact words here, but it's basically. Um, Use the gospel to examine yourself. On what do you naturally rely upon to measure your virtue and your value? Uh, be honest with yourself. Where do you, on what grounds do you look at yourself and say, I am good, I am part of the solution, I am part, I'm right. And how does a gospel that is for those who believe it is by faith in Jesus' faithfulness, how does that confront you? How does that healthfully undermine you and if you're brave in your groups uh, reflect on that share it with one another and if you have time um, pray for one another and then we'll come back and we'll finish up our time with the discussion